chapter 26 the triumph of the middle class 1945 1963 so we're still in that era between uh, the end of World War II and the uh, uh, assassination of uh, President John Kennedy and we're talking about the American middle class here the triumph of the middle class is the, is the title of the chapter so the rise of the middle class happens at the same time that the coal work goes on so these both rise at the same time and we talked about the people that lived in fear of a bomb destroying the world at any moment while while they were happily socializing in their backyards. Uh, the threat of nuclear war continued throughout this era. And although the massive fear ended with the successful conclusion of the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, as the years go by, even though the fear continued, it became less of an hysteria. So like lots of things... Uh, you hear something may happen, but it never does. So you lose faith that it ever will, okay? Uh, but it remained a constant in the back of everyone's minds. Uh, do we still live under the threat of instant annihilation? Yeah, we do, but, but we're so conditioned to it that it seems surreal, like it will never actually happen. So we, we talked about this post-war era, 1945, 63, 1963, for white America, a time of prosperity and affluence, the rise of a, of a new consumer culture. So we saw it in the 20s, and now we're, now we're back even bigger and better. And it's, it's back to this idea of keeping up with the Joneses, uh, putting up uh, fronts to make yourself appear like you're wealthy becomes an American ideal. Is that the way American society is today? Uh, I think that you could you could argue that it is. Uh, so so remember we've gone through a lot here. Society changed from the frugal depression to the post-war consumer economy in under a decade. Okay. So the United States asserts its authority at uh, what's called the United Nations Monetary and Financial Conference, July 44. The war's still going on, but you're you're starting to try to figure out how you're going to move ahead financially, monetarily, uh, economically in, in Europe and as well as the rest of the world. So this, this conference is held in Bretton Woods. That's a term in your book, New Hampshire, July 1944, an international conference of 44 nations to help in the rebuilding of Europe. And they created a new monetary system that became known as the Bretton Woods system. The World Bank was developed create loans for Western European countries to repair their infrastructure and also for developing uh, countries that were developing in general, okay? Also establish the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, to attempt to secure or steady international currencies. And it was determined to use the, the U.S. dollar as the standard. So why would they do that? Well, again, America was not damaged by World War II. It didn't look like this. America was left untouched. Nothing happened on U.S. soil uh, with the exception of Pearl Harbor. Well, of course, we can't forget that men gave their lives, but 400,000 versus millions is not the same. So with the exception of the, of the grief of losing a lot of men, life was good in America in general compared to the European countries. It, uh, America was a stable country uh, that was experiencing an economic boom. So it was the logical choice, okay? 1947, the General Agreement on Tariffs was passed to oversee and regulate international trade. So there's that word again, regulate. That's a liberal word. Big government at home, regulations abroad, okay? Um, America ha has had grown. It's growing. It had the country and the world gotten too big to think it could be managed by isolationism and staying out of everything and by laissez-faire small governments okay America realized where we're, we're, there's too much at stake here the, the the world's too big we've got to change our approach so together Bretton Woods and the IMF uh, stabilized world trade uh, and it pushed for the economic structure of America open free markets because again America is the only one standing it makes sense to copy them. Let's do it there. We look at them. It works for them. Uh, so we talked before about the Allies' anger, uh, as, as specifically Russia, at America for not entering the war sooner. And while that had a negative effect on the early years of the war because of the death and carnage, it ultimately had a positive effect on post-war America 
and its place in the world. It had less years of warfare, less, less people were lost. So, so uh, Russia and America, the two powers left standing after World War II, but, but Russia was in disrepair also. They had war wounds and lost millions of people. Again, America only lost 400,000, a huge tragic number, but nothing like Europeans' losses. Uh, this put them in an opportunistic position to er exert strength and influence. And one of the outcomes of the post-war, due to the Cold War, was the continuation of the buildup of the military during a time of peace. Uh, but now you're fighting communism and you're, you're containing. So you, you, you've got to have a, a, a military be at the ready to go anywhere in the world, stop communism, to fulfill the Truman Doctrine, okay? So Eisenhower, 1960, at his farewell address to the nation upon leaving office prior to John Kennedy, uh, coming in, gave a chilling warning to America to be aware of the military-industrial complex. I have 1,800 nuclear missiles, 283 battleships, 9,400 planes. I spend more on my military than the next 12 nations combined. And despite spending more of a year, I still feel insecure. It's simple. You have a military-industrial complex. This, of course, is is a caricature of Freud, and he's psychoanalyzing uh, Uncle Sam, and Uncle Sam's uh, obsession with with defense. Okay, uh, so what is this military-industrial complex? Well, what what it is is it's he's warning about a close relationship that the government has with its defense industry, and he urged his successors, namely Kennedy, to strike a balance between a strong national defense and diplomacy in dealing with the Soviet Union. He expressed concerns about the growing influence of what he termed the military-industrial complex. Eisenhower warned of the comfortable relationship that had developed between the government and, manu and the manufacturers of defense products. Uh, this can produce benefits for both sides and perhaps lead to corruption. Uh, but, you know, a, a hawkish government needs tools of, 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 to wage war. So we've talked about hawks and doves. A hawk is a pro-war person. They look at the answer to, to conflicts is war. A dove looks to, to, the, to oppose that and, and, and desire for nonviolence and, and negotiation, okay? Um, but in the 1960, it was a hawkish government. Uh, and the concern was that these, these defense companies were receiving these multi-million, multi-billion dollar contracts, uh, and this idea of war for profit came up. So are we fighting a war to, to further our ideology or defend or to fight for freedom, or are we fighting a war to create profits? Wars are profitable. Wars create uh, booming economies and, and, and businesses – uh, do very well. If you're in the defense business, you do very well during war. So this this idea of a war for profit would become an, an issue of contention in the up and upcoming war in Vietnam. So remember the young people, the baby boomers who who did the opposite of their parents and they questioned authority. What are we fighting this war for? Is it about profit? So in this era, you're not at war, but the military became huge and became its own bureaucracy, and, and it ignited its own industry. The aerospace industry fueled millions of families' incomes until Russia imploded in the early 1990s. And, and this is right out of your book. Science, industry, and the government became intertwined. The government operated at full tilt regarding the military creating an incredible arms race and a space race was an offshoot of this. So the yeah, arms race, meaning that you're trying to stay ahead of Russia as far as the number of weapons you have and space race in the, in the late fifties, mid, mid late fifties was who's going to get to space first. Okay. Uh, and this happens. Uh, Sputnik is launched into space in 1957 uh, and this is a deep disappointment that Americans felt when Russia beat them, beat the United States into space. Uh, so Sputnik, first satellite into space. This, this is not a manned uh, satellite, but still it's, it's the first satellite into space. So why was this such a concern for Americans? Wouldn't this, wouldn't this benefit everyone, the technology gained from this? 
but but the worry now is that Russia's in space. That means they can they can be above us where we can't see them. You can you can see them in the atmosphere, but in space you can't. Uh, and are they going to drop weapons from space on us? Are they going to to surveil us? Uh, satellites today, of course, this is the world we live in. They, they track every move we make. Uh, we don't realize it, but trust me, we are being surveilled and recorded every day. Okay. So Americans are worried that their educational system was not producing enough scientists and engineers. The Russians, the Russians beat you to space. So Americans didn't want to fall behind intellectually. This led to the national, um, I'm sorry, I missed just one slide. This idea of, of war th of, from space and dropping bombs from space. This is where the idea for Star Wars comes from. And this, uh, this defense system that Ronald Reagan will promote in the, in the 1980s called Star Wars is fear of, 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 you know, a weapon weaponry coming at you from space. Okay. So the, so the national defense education act is passed in 1958 because America feels like they're falling behind intellectually that, that Russia is ahead of them. So you want to create more scientists, more engineers. So, so this act injected millions of dollars into American universities. Uh, of course, the, the defense buildup led to the rise of more corporate power. So 50 years after Teddy Roosevelt was busting trusts, in this era, America was dominated by massive corporations that in some cases cornered the market and stunted <coughs> competition. Is that the way that it still is today? I mean, you could argue that. The world economy today is corporate and it's global, okay? So the post-war era, because of all these ideas, um, uh, rebuilding Europe and, and, and these, all these acts and fighting communists means that the economy continued to boom and it created an affluent society. And I'm not talking about the super rich. I'm talking about a developing middle class. Remember, we talked about the white collar and how the blue collar workers were, were promoted by, by initiative or hard work and, and got these white collar jobs. So good times expanded for white families in traditional roles. Maybe we talked about father knows best, that idyllic, perfect white family. So, so America became a, a consumer culture or society, hugely fueled by successful advertising. Did anybody watch the popular TV show Mad Men? This was a show that was, was on uh, probably, probably uh, ended five or six years ago. But historians look fondly at that show as a mostly accurate look at 50s America um, in its depiction of the roles of men, women, and minorities, and especially how women are oppressed and treated, you know, um, not very well. Um, the show centered around the advertising industry in 1950s New York on Madison Avenue or Mad Avenue or Mad Men, okay? Um, let's take our first break and watch the film entitled Androcentrism in Mad Men, and then come on back. Okay, so this becomes a huge industry in America, advertising. So consumerism is fueled by slick advertising. Uh, advertising created an hysteria about items. People had to have them, and these and these advertisers know how to how to get people to do that. So everyone wanted the new consumer product. So huge industry to get people to buy things by talking them into believing they need them when in reality they don't. Okay, so wartime production during the war was quite successful. They they had learned from the Industrial Revolution. Remember Gustavus Swift and Henry Ford perfected the assembly line and they pumped out war products by the thousands during the war. The United States military was not without supplies. So this practice continued in the post-war years. It just simply shifted to consumer goods, okay? Okay, let's uh, change directions a little bit here and do a supplemental lecture. That's not what I want right there. There it is. And talk about the GI Bill, okay? Um, so this is a uh, this is a, a benefit that comes out of World War II and begins here. You, you didn't have the GI Bill before World War II, okay? So let's let me give you the uh, sketch outline of our lecture. Number one, background and development. Uh, letter uh, was this number one. Letter A, GI Bill, opportunities for returning vets, and then a subletter one to avoid the embarrassments of World War One. 
Number two, benefits. Letter A, college tuition. Letter B, home loans. Letter uh, number three, results, suburbs, uh, is letter A. Letter B, minorities kept out by institutionalized racism. Sub, sub letter one, no loans in inner cities from banks. And number two, deeds of covenant. Number four, relevance. The GI Bill allowed returning vets to prosper, but non-whites were kept from the opportunity by a deeply institutionalized racism and deeds of covenants. White America gained great wealth from the skyrocketing real estate market, resulting in a rise of power and position. But non-whites were left out, resulting in the inequality of wealth that we have today. Okay, so again, you, you have the ability to go back and, and hear that over again, so I'm not going to repeat it. So go ahead. If you need to write, uh, take some time and, and write that all down, please do. Okay, let's get started. Uh, so the GI Bill. Uh, this is for veterans of World War II. Uh, they're given advantages for advancement in society when they returned. So that it, it, this is a, a reward for them, and this is called the GI Bill. So what does GI mean? It means government issue. And so a tank, a uniform, a, a, a whatever it might be, a, a typically equipment, but it came to be known as it used as a name to describe troops. So if you were a, a person in the Army, you were a GI, okay? So the GI Bill funded college for returning veterans. You didn't have that opportunity before. Uh, this did, was not given to returning vets after World War I. And in fact, after World War I, it was somewhat of an embarrassment what happened to the veterans that came back from that war. So the GI Bill was an attempt to, to uh, alleviate that for the World War II vets. Never again do we want to see the honor and glory of our nation fade to the extent that her men of arms with despondent heart and palsied limb totter from door to door, bowing their souls to the frozen bosom of reluctant charity. So many of the World War I vets didn't get this opportunity and, and were not able to integrate back into society and had to, to rely on charity to get by. So this is an attempt to not make that mistake again. So funded college for returning veterans. This is amazing. I, I looked at, upon college education as likely as my own in a Rolls Royce for the chauffeur. It was seen like that. It was seen as something for the very wealthy. In this era, American education became known as the best in the world, and there were many people that graduated college, many returning veterans. But this trend would continue as the baby boomers grew up. So the GI Bill is considered to be the most important educational and social transformation in American history. So I want you to understand when I'm talking about this in this lecture, I am not criticizing the GI Bill in it. I'm, I'm doing the opposite. The, the GI Bill is a wonderful thing that, that is given to veterans and, and they've earned it and deserve it. Okay. The, the, the uh, context of this lecture is not the GI Bill, but how racism kept some people from taking advantage of it, even though they had the right to. Okay. So, a social transformation, but who's taking advantage of this? Mostly white veterans. So how were black and Hispanic Asian veterans kept out of taking advantage of this? They were veterans too, okay? Um, well, the, the, the white vets took advantage of the government guaranteed housing loans that resulted in these fast growing suburbs, these communities that were away from the inner city. Uh, these homes rose greatly in value in the coming decades. Nobody expected that. Nobody expected these simple, modest homes to, to, to uh, increase in value so much, but they did. So if you bought a home in the, in the 40s, late 40s, 50s, or early 60s, and you kept that home for 10, 20 years, you, you benefited greatly from the rise in the real estate values in this country. Uh, this this was a, an incredible boost in value that nobody anticipated. So uh, the people that went to the suburbs were able to take a, uh, take advantage of this and get this windfall. It, it was somewhat of luck. You none of, none of these men were wealthy. None of these men had anything else going for them than anybody else did. But they just simply were bought a home and an increase in value. Okay, this this created a new wealth for whites during the post war era. But generally, black, Hispanic, Asian veterans weren't able to make use of the GI Bill. So why? They, they had fought too. 
they were veterans. Why, why weren't they taking advantage of it? Well, and this is the institutionalized racism part. So institutionalized racism is racism that's built in that we, that everybody just kind of accepts because it's always been that way and nobody questions it, okay? So banks would generally not make loans for mortgages in black or Hispanic neighborhoods. Uh, they, they wanted to make loans for in the suburbs and, 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 and do their business here. Uh, but, but, but the black and Hispanic families were also excluded from the suburbs. So how do you do that? You can't just tell someone you can't live someplace, can you? Uh, well, they, they, they did. And they did it with the combination of what is called a deed of covenants and also a deeply rooted racism. So what's a deed of covenant? Well, this is wording that's that's put into the original home deeds, the mortgage papers. So it's discriminatory language that's in the in the papers themselves. So here you see an example on the left. Only members of the Caucasian race can buy this home or live in this neighborhood. On the right is, is a sign from the from the community. We want white tenants in our white community. This is this is the 60s and 50s that that, that this is happening. Uh, this is not happening in South only, it's happening nationwide. And this idea that this lot shall be owned and occupied by people of the Caucasian race only, Caucasian, Caucasian meaning white, uh, this occurred everywhere, not just in the South, like I said. Th this, this quote here is from a deed from Seattle, okay? Here's another quote, no person or, or persons of Asiatic, African, or Negro blood, lineage, or extraction shall be permitted to occupy a portion of said property. So being a veteran of a world war didn't matter. If you were not white, you were excluded. So this racism that we've been talking about that exploded after World War I and African Americans trying to, you know, be accepted and, and be equal, you know, we're fighting for fighting for America's freedom too. It happens after World War II also. So Jim Crow seemed to be everywhere, not just in the South, okay? Uh, this racism continues after the war. Uh, uh, Non-white veterans still do not gain their respect for risking your life for America, okay? So the key to this lecture, the GI Bill created a long-term boom in white wealth but did almost nothing to help non-whites to build wealth because of the, the racing real estate prices that, that just flew up. Nobody expected that. It, uh, the, the white people didn't gain the wealth because they're smarter or superior or, or better. They just got it by racism. The others were kept out, okay? Um, so this, of course, results in the inequality of wealth that we that we have today. Okay, uh, the the GI Bill did allow minority veterans to go to college, go to graduate school, but most had to go to overcrowded black colleges. Uh, so in some cases, in some cases, these subsidized black students forced many white universities to allow non-white students. So it's the beginning of beginnings of the integration of higher education. But without question, the GI Bill in general uh, created a a, uh, a a different kind of America uh, where buying a home became possible. Um, homes were financed with the GI Bill, no down, low interest. Houses were being built everywhere. This fueled the consumer culture, the economic boom. It resulted in construction everywhere, department stores, and automobiles. Okay, so what is the relevance of the lecture? The GI Bill allowed returning vets to prosper, but non-whites were kept from the opportunity by a deeply institutionalized racism and deeds of covenants. White America gained great wealth from the skyrocketing real estate market resulting in a rise of power and position. But non-whites were left out, resulting in the inequality of wealth that we have today. Okay? Okay, that is the end of supplemental lesson number 10. Okay? Uh, so moving on. So the, you also have the, the start of the, of the VA, the Veterans Administration. So this is an organization to assist returning veterans, get them medical care, help them to assimilate back into society. It's not easy... Uh, going from war one day and then back home. Uh, so you have the, you know, the transition, okay, the VA is there to help you. 
the VA, the VA also uh, help with home loans and buying a house. Uh, okay, so the economy's booming after the war. All these, uh, the the economy keeps on going because you've got all these regions to keep on producing uh, houses and cars and consumer culture. And we've already talked about about Mad Men and the industry and the advertising and, and how the consumer culture is the result of advertising. People buy items simply to show off the brand. The quality of the item's not that important, much as it is today. Okay. Uh, but you also have the rise of television. Television is invented in this era. It becomes an obsession for people. Entertainment in your own living room. But this became a vehicle for advertising, as well as creating a lifestyle, that father knows best lifestyle. Uh, could you argue that, Amer that the television became a vehicle for Americanization, continuing manifest destiny, because it promoted only a white culture? Okay. Uh, there wasn't any depictions of non-white families on TV in those days. It was like they didn't exist, except for the menial laborer and custodian and maid. Other than that, they they just they weren't part of of, of the of what the um, you know ideal American was trying to become. Okay, so TV was free. You you bought one and it was free over the air with an antenna. Of course, this is pre-cable or satellite. Um, you had you had three three channels. And that was it. You might have a, one or two or three uh, local channels that, that in many cases didn't amount to much. But that was enough. That was more than what you had before. So companies, uh, advertising companies uh, made money in, in by putting their, their products on TV. Uh, th these companies carried a lot of clout and they sponsored shows with their name on it. And this became a, a huge part of the culture of the baby boomers television. So the advertisers realize, you know, we should we should target the baby boomers, these young young people growing up post-war. So a youth culture is developed, and a part of it is you see, you know, young young people having fun and and expressing themselves. A lot of this has to do with that they had the time to do it. And what, what do I, I mean by that? Well, before the war, you didn't have time to express yourself and be frivolous. You you worked. You, you had to work to help your family. Post-war, it's different. The, the suburbs create this opportunity, and the and the world change and this and the country changed. Uh, you know, you, you have time to get together and with your friends and talk about the world, develop a voice. Post-war America created this, okay, um, and it also creates a um, a kind of a, a rebellious, restless idea. This is promoted by advertising. Uh, advertising um, saw this, and if we promote youth, it gave us, it gave them a new target, a new group to target for products. So they start to come out with rebellious teen themes, and and uh, you know products for the rebellious teen. And movies began to push the rebellious teen. Okay, so this youth culture was created, and enhanced by TV and advertising, and it still thrives in today's society. Uh, we still have I mean, advertising still targets young people to try to push them and promote an ideal that maybe is not even really happening, but they think it is. So we've got to go out and buy these clothes. We've got, got to go out and buy these records and watch these movies and, and so on. OK. Uh, music becomes a big part of the youth culture in the late 50s, mid 50s, uh, turning into the 60s. And we talked before about black music being performed by white artists. Um, and of course, the the record companies realized if I could find a white man who had the Negro sound, the Negro feel, I can make a billion dollars. And of course, we talked about who that is, Elvis Presley. Uh, and and they do make billions of dollars. So the so rock and roll changed music from this romantic style, operatic, smooth voices, crooners to African rhythms and syncopations. You know, drums became prominent for the first time. R and B, what does that stand for? Rhythm and blues. So you're talking about playing blues with, with the rhythm section, a guitar and bass behind you with the drum, a, a later a lead guitarist and a singer, and this would absolutely change music forever. Uh, so the rebellious youth culture is born. And in many cases, they weren't exactly sure what they were, were rebelling about, but they just knew that they should be rebellious because it was pushed, pushed by advertisers, much to their parents' disdain. 
So the parents are very concerned. There's a loss of Victorian values. There's premarital sex, drinking, fear of interracial dating. They've done so much to keep non-whites out of the suburbs. Remember the deed of covenants. But now their children are letting them back in. Uh, this, this, so, the, so the youth are watching their parents' reaction. This led to dissent among the youth against their parents and their, and their generation. Uh, this would explode in the 1960s, okay? One of the most famous movies or popular movies at, at that time was Rebel Without a Cause, starring James Dean. So that's an interesting title, Rebel Without a Cause. I'm not sure what I'm rebelling about, but I'm going to rebel anyway. I don't really have a cause, but I'm going to, I'm going to do it anyway, okay? Um, okay, um, let's do this. Um, let's, get, let's watch the next... Uh, Let's see. One, two. Next, uh, the, the next two um, films are are entitled um, about a knife fight and a chicky. I think it's chicky run. Um, these are both clips from the um, uh, film um, Rebel Without a Cause. So go ahead and watch those two films and then come on back. Okay, so you know we're not sure what these people are fighting about. They, these are white kids of privilege, but they're angry. And, and, you know, rebellious and antisocial. Of course, their parents are saying, I don't understand. We, we created this nice life for you in the suburbs. What have you got to complain about? But this, this happens. And can't, if, you, if you study it closely, you can see it was created by the advertising industry. Okay. Uh, the next film that came out that, that has to do with, with this rebellious youth is West Side Story. Uh, this is, a, again, pushing teen rebellion movies to create a fervor among the youth. So this is a film about gangs, which, of course, we know a lot about today. Uh, our present day society has a lot of influence of gangs. But this is this is in New York City. In the 50s, you have white gangs versus Puerto Rican gangs. OK. So this is a musical. So understand that it's portrayed in that way. It's a violent idea, but it's portrayed with dance and music. Okay. So this this was a a little bit of a different idea of a movie. But understand that in America, in the early '60s, musicals were huge. You'd have them for years, and people loved musicals. So this one came out. It's got the dance. It's got the the music, it's got the singing, but it has a different theme. And it and it it completely, you know, uh charged the country. Oh my gosh, you know, what is this all about? Okay. Uh so go ahead and watch the two West Side Story um films. One is called The Opening Act, I think. I don't have my list in front of me. And the other one is called Um America. Okay. So go ahead and watch those two films. And then come on back. Okay, so this is the culture. This is the culture of the baby boomers, who today, of course, are, are old. They're, they're older now. Um, uh, the baby boom was a result of the prosperity. The number of births skyrocketed, okay? Um, life was good if you were white, except for that pesky flash in the sky that could happen at any moment. Uh, Health care majorly expanded and improved. The, the idea of wellness visits. Uh, vaccinations became the norm in public schools. Uh, parents began to seek advice in in raising their kids to do it right, or at least how they how they saw what was right. Um, what about women? How they fare in the post-war era? They start to enter the workplace. College becomes more popular for women, uh, but didn't always result in a job. Okay. Um, men continue to get most of the choice jobs. Uh, so it's a, it's a it's a struggle for women. It, it it just seems to always be that way. They never were seen as equal. They are always seen as subservient. So when they come into these jobs, they just were looked down upon. We saw that in the in the in the uh, film clip about Mad Men, condescended to constantly. Is that the way that it is today? It still is in a lot of cases. Uh, so women, even with the degree, were left out. In some cases, when women would go to college and get a degree. And then come back and become a housewife because that's what it was expected to you. So you're a you're an educated housewife, but you're still gonna gonna do the laundry, fold the clothes, make the meals, and and do the do the uh, do the shopping. Okay, 
Uh, so even with the degree, women's opportunities were limited to teaching, nursing, and you know, secretarial, service-oriented positions, receptionists, waitresses. Okay. Uh, so I mean, it's still a battle today regarding women's place in the home or in society. Where should it be? But a lot of it in this era, the 60s, early 60s, women went to work to keep up with the lifestyle, to keep up with that consumer culture, to 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 better be able to have the the uh, the items that show that, that you've arrived, cars and homes and wardrobes and travel. Uh, you uh, when 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 we went to work to subsidize the family's income to keep up with consumerism, uh, to afford the items that the advertising firms can convince people they had to have, uh, but they face less pay than a man. So again, why you know hadn't women proved themselves in two world wars? What about Rosie? She could do the work of any man. But discrimination, still, they weren't white men. They were viewed as inferior and not as capable, okay? Okay, let's do a supplemental lecture here, number 11. This is entitled The Feminine Mystique. Okay, so uh, background, uh, I'm sorry, sketch outline, number one. Background development, letter A. Society encouraged women to return to a domestic role. Number two. Friedan. This is Betty Friedan. F-R-I-E-D-A-N. Letter A. Educated, but a housewife. Letter B. Surveyed her female friends. Letter C. Found that most were unhappy with their domestic lives. Number three. Uh, the problem that has no name. Letter A. Women were depressed and dissatisfied. Letter B. Affected their husbands and children. Um, number four, more for Dan, letter A, criticized for focusing on white educated women, letter B, excluded lesbians from her now organization. And lastly, number five, the relevance, her vision, passion, foresight, and hard work helped create a society where women are more equal to men and have more choices when deciding how to live their lives. She has made a lasting impact on American society. Okay, let's go ahead and get started here. So The Feminine Mystique is actually a book that was written in, the, in 1963. So this is our era. Suburbia became the new craze, and this is what everyone aspired to. But it turned out that this perfect life in this idyllic suburbs was not so perfect with the women who lived in them. These booms of the 1950s had a particularly confining effect on many American women. And when we were inundated with advice, books, and magazine articles to promote them to stay in the home and be a homemaker. And I, uh, you know, titles of, of books and magazines like Don't Be Afraid to Marry Young. Okay, Cooking to Me is Poetry, Femininity Begins at Home. So all these magazines and books are urging women to leave the workforce and embrace their roles as wives and mother. Return to the kitchen. Re re return to motherhood. That's the... That's a woman's most important job was to bear and rear children, okay? This is hardly a new idea, but but for the first time, women start to speak out about it, okay? It began to generate a great deal of dissatisfaction among women who yearned for a more fulfilling life. So in her 1963 book, The Feminine Mystique, Betty Friedan, a women's rights advocate, argued that the suburbs were burying women alive. And all of this in her book and her points of view contributed to the rebirth of the feminist movement in the 1960s. So for Dan had trained as a psychologist at, at the University of California at Berkeley. <clears throat> but when she graduated, she became a suburban housewife and mother in New York. So it didn't matter. Her degree didn't do anything for her. She was still expected to be a housewife. Uh, and she would supplement her husband's income by writing freelance articles for women's magazines and kind of got on that on a roll with that. OK, she went to a 15 year reunion of her of her college class and conducted a survey of her former classmate classmates, all women, and found that most of them were like she was dissatisfied suburban housewives. <clears throat> so she charted this. American middle class women's transformation from the independent, career minded new woman of the 1920s, the flapper, we remember her, into the housewife of the post war years. So 
40 years go by, how do you go from independence to back in the kitchen? So that's what this book is about. Uh, you know, it was, again, women were put on that pedestal and they were supposed to find fulfillment in their duties as mother and wife. So her research, her survey turned into her book called The Feminine Mystique. This is regarded as one of the most influential nonfiction books of the 20th century. It helped to ignite the women's movement in the 1960s and 70s, and it transformed American society and culture. And in the book, she talks about this idea that's called the, uh, the problem that has no name. Okay. Uh, so I, I missed this slide. Uh, she argued that the suburbs were bearing women alive, and this, this contributed to the re rebirth of the, of the uh, women's movement. Okay. The problem that has no name, which is simply the fact that American women are kept from growing to their full human capacities, is taking a far greater toll on the physical and mental health of our country than any known disease. That's a pretty radical idea. And people are saying, what? Is she crazy? But this is how she sees it. The 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 uh, the suburbs and the and the uh, domestic slavery of women is holding them back from 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 their from their lives. Uh you know, uh, so the problem that has no name is women's depression and lack of satisfaction that was so widely common among American housewives of the 50s. And again, not not due to their lack of femininity, but rather to an excess of education in this time and, and awareness. So the difference now is these, these women are educated. So the problem that has no name touched not only on the wife and or mother's lack of satisfaction, but also it affected the husband and children, too. Uh, you know, it, 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 it casts a pall across the whole entire family. Uh, so according to Friedan, understanding the feminine mystique and the roots of the problem that has no name could lead to a different understanding of the development of the entire American nation and a response to the patriarchy or the male dominance that had formerly been silent. Nobody was speaking up about this, but women, women start to change. And they decide we don't have to buy into this anymore. Society changed. We've changed. We want more. Uh, the overwhelming response of readers uh, uh, were that they were also similarly dissatisfied in that role. Uh, so for Dan, starts a revolution with this book. Okay, This leads her to, to start the NOW organization, the National Org Organization of Women in 1966. She's a co-founder. Uh, this organization worked towards increasing women's rights. She helped found and lead other women's groups, such as the National Women's Political Caucus in 1971. <clears throat> as a leader of these organizations, she was influential in helping change outdated laws that were disadvantageous to women, such as sex segregated help wanted ads, hiring practices, unequal pay, firing a woman who's pregnant instead of providing her with maternity leave, all these types of things start to come in, dissolve with this movement. Uh, so within this diverse women's movement, Ferdinand did receive criticism for, in, in many people's points of view, she focused too much on issues that faced primarily white, middle-class, educated, heterosexual women. She did not accept lesbians into now. Uh, that was a different topic to her. She was homophobic. She didn't see she, she didn't see lesbianism as a women's issue. That was a gay issue. Go over there. Don't, don't come over here. Okay, so she's criticized for that. Uh, radical feminists also criticized her for working with men. But for Dan insisted that the women's movement had to remain in the American mainstream or it would be dismissed and nothing would change. And she was probably right. Without that, it wouldn't have had the success it had. So in the end, for Dan's mainstream attitude provided a balance to the to the other women rights leaders' more radical atti attitudes. Okay, uh, she would publish several more books. She taught at New York University and the University of Southern California, as well as lectured widely at women's conferences around the world. Okay, so the relevance of the lecture is her vision, passion, foresight, and hard work helped create a society where women are more equal to men and have more choices when deciding how to live their lives, she has made a lasting impact on American society, okay? Okay, that is the end of supplemental lecture number 11. Uh, but domesticity reigned. Father knows best was the ideal that white people strive for. Stay-at-home mom, 
dad goes to work and the suburbs reigned okay so the suburbs were created were created by what is called white flight this is the idea that you've got highways and roads now you can drive to work everybody's got a car uh you know you you don't have to live in the inner in the inner city anymore but it was also the fear of minorities moving into all white schools and neighborhoods because because that was happening whites moved out and the whites left the inner city white flight they leave uh this resulted in the inner cities becoming predominantly poor and black because they didn't have the same opportunities as the white people did so the whites leave the urban city but the minorities remain they have no way out then the, the, you have another uh, another idea called urban renewal, where the governments, city governments, said that they're they're going to re, uh, renew the the inner cities and downtowns. Uh, so people were pushed out by that, where they came in and tore down established neighborhoods to to build new communities to make the downtown more appealing. This resulted in these poor people not having any place to go. So the urban renewal of these lower class neighborhoods, uh, you know, new condos, condos, sorry, attract young urban professionals and they drive the rents up and they drive out the long time lower income residents. So the gentrification means it's, it's becoming white again. OK, so this idea begins when you when you do some renewal, artists move in looking for a cheap place to live. They, they give the. The neighborhood of a, a bohemian flair okay uh, it becomes popular this this hip reputation attracts young professionals who want to live in such an atmosphere so they drive out the lower income artists and lower income residents the ethnic racial minorities and the and the social character of the neighborhood changes and it becomes white again so where did the, did the displaced people go where are the non-white people that never seem to get a break where do they go they go to the projects housing projects are built in the inner cities to as a place for these poor people to live so this looks like a couple of things an indian reservation tenements in new york city it's the same same idea okay uh it, you know, Indian removal. You, you've taken the, the the you took the Indians out of the uh, the South for for the plantation society. You you intern the Japanese during World War II because what they look like. This is the same thing. You remove them from the cities and put them in these projects. Okay. Uh, so does anyone ever learn? So projects became unsafe areas for families because they have no opportunity, no chance for, for uh, you know, in many cases, buying a job. The schools were awful, you know, outdated materials, dilapidated buildings. So drugs and gangs take over and becomes unsafe. Uh, but they have no other choice because of the color of their skin. OK, you don't see any white families living in the projects. Not not very often anyway. So how, how do you escape this? You know, no hope leads to hopelessness and frustration and anger. OK, so the so the uh, rise of the middle class is a great boom for white America, but not so much everybody else. OK, so the, the the key interest of this chapter is how this middle class expanded and how it positively changed the lives of white people. And here you see the the dichotomy though you've got on the one hand on the left hand you've got prosperity and progress in the future but on the other hand you've got this chance that it can all be gone with one bomb so the country still lived with the with the opening fear of the cold war and the possible extermination of the entire planet okay okay that is the end of chapter 26